and welcome to PCB Chat, where we talk with experts across the printed circuit design, manufacturing, and electronic supply chain fields. I'm Mike Buto, Editor-in-Chief of PCDNF and Circuits Assembly. First, a word from today's sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Turnkey Pro from Sierra Circuits. What if you could source your components, upload your specs, and receive an instant quote in less than 15 minutes? What if your designs could be fabricated and assembled and delivered to your door in five days with a guarantee of zero defects? Then try Turnkey Pro from Sierra Circuits for your next design and use promo code PCBCHAT to receive $200 off your next order. Folks who have tuned in in the past know that I'm always eager to hear about what's going on in the minds of the next generation of engineers. I'm lucky to have several of them with us today. Under the auspices of the Rochester Institute of Technology Center for Electronics Manufacturing and Assembly, also known as SEMA, we have a team of students who have automated pre-soldering inspection analysis. We have with us Carmela Stone, Ian Youngs, Ethan Brochar, Bradley Brewster, and they are joined today by Martin Anselm, who is the director of SEMA, and Dwayne Beck, a visiting lecturer. So welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, yeah, good yeah, to be thanks here. Thanks for having us. Hello. Dwayne and Martin, let's start with you. Could you give our listeners an overview of what SEMA is and maybe touch a little bit on its goals? Sure. So I am the director of the Center for Electronics Manufacturing and Assembly. That's the acronym SEMA. And the, the goals of SEMA Lab is to educate students, graduate students, as well as undergraduate students and industry in the electronics manufacturing area, specifically surface mount robotics and assembly. We also use SEMA for research in materials and process development. And uh, it's been around since 2000 or so. I took over in 2014 as a new faculty member. And Dwayne, um, maybe you could elaborate a little on what your role is. I teach a course called the uh, Production Systems Design and Production Systems Development. And in here, this is where the graduating seniors will put together some kind of automation. So in working with uh, Martin, as far as looking at the SEMA lab, we're always looking for ways that the students can take something that's been done by assembly and see if they can automate it. And so uh, he and I started talking back and forth and we came up with an idea based on a, a project that he uh, produces as a uh, giveaway to the Imagine RIT. And so the students um, put a lot of effort into it. Within the 15 weeks, we not only designed and built and tested and implemented the automation cell within the SEMA lab. Okay, well, we're gonna get into that a little bit more in a moment, but let's first uh, talk with the, uh, with the students themselves. I'm going to introduce each of you and then perhaps you could share a few things about yourself, such as your year of school and maybe your particular engineering interests. Uh, let me start with uh, Carmela Stone. All of us, uh, I think, except Ian, are just graduated this past semester. I, right now, I'm working at Thermo Fisher Scientific, so I'm working more on um, medical device or medical labware, um, working on um, COVID-related uh, products. What's your general focus? This, this class is mainly uh, for the manufacturing engineering technology students. And now um, the school changed the major to uh, robotics um, and manufacturing. That was the, the major change. Great. <laughs> Ian, your turn. Okay, so I'm Ian Youngs, and I'm a part-time student at RIT. I started my college career at MCC and graduated in 2016 with a mechanical engineering technology associate's degree. And then I began working at Eastman Kodak as a mechanical technician in uh, 2016, and then they graciously offered to send me back to school for engineering in 2017, and I've uh, gone to RIT since the spring of 17. So, in my major is uh, before they made the switch to the robotics and manufacturing. So I guess my my program path is uh, manufacturing engineering technology. Thanks, uh, Ethan. 
My name is Ethan Brochar. I recently just uh, graduated. Uh, I see myself as an entrepreneur. Uh, currently, I'm working at a food packaging place. Uh, I am a maintenance automation engineer and shift manager. So I have a team of individuals that I lead to uh, keep the lines running. I took that uh, job to further my own goals. I plan to start a factory within the next 10 years and make some money. <laughs> Great pursuit. Um, how about uh, how about you, Brad? Hello, my name is Bradley Brewster. Obviously, I just graduated in the robotics and manufacturing engineering technology. Within that, I work at Access New York, which kind of works hand in hand with our IT, hence why I'm here right now. Um, my primary job is utilizing cobots to automate cells within other companies to basically work overnight and um, kind of step in where normally people would be. Thanks. And I'd be remiss if I don't mention Kyle Mellendorf as well, who I believe was the fifth student that worked on this project. So turning now to your research, this is internally called a capstone project. What does that mean? So our capstone is kind of an accumulation of everything that we've learned throughout our time here at RIT. It's in our curriculum to take two co-ops. Um, so that really gets us a job experience that we probably wouldn't get elsewise. I can definitely tell through each member's experience coming from that job, it helped our capstone so much. Um, and so, yeah, our, our capstone is just like, showing all of our knowledge, all of our classes, everything that we learned. And uh, I would really like to point out that uh, this, this project wouldn't have been a success if we didn't all have our specializations that we came at it from different ways. Capstone is also to close the gap in between their educational environment and industry. And the purpose of a capstone is by the time you finish the capstone, you should be able to step into industry. And that's what these students have been able to do. Well, obviously, anything we can do to automate the SMT process is generally welcome. That said, what led you to concentrate on refining the soldering process? So I can describe the uh, objective of the capstone. Uh, Dr. Beck came to me and said, you have this wonderful laboratory here. Is there something we can do as a capstone for our students in this class? And I said, um, one of the limitations that a lot of companies have is 100% test off the SMT line. So as it, it, this wasn't actually a soldering project, it was a, a test project. And uh, I gave them a very old, probably circa 1990s conveyor with old PLCs in it and the SMEMA system for communication up line and down line. And it was basically just a framework for them to convert a conveyor into a test bed for testing this little RIT board here. So this RIT board has a, a series of surface mount components on it. There's nothing on the back. Um, and it has a, a physical switch on the side to turn it on and off. And once it, the, all the components are placed, including the switch, it's on and ready to be powered. And you can see there are two small through holes here. Um, so they basically took the place of a little battery pack like this that gets through holes mounted into the circuit board as a manual process, and they tested the functionality of the blinking lights. So I gave them a framework. I said, here's a conveyor. You have to be able to test one of these boards every 15 to 30 seconds because that's how quickly they're coming off the line. Go build me a tester. And then they had a semester to convert an old 1990s conveyor into a 100% testing machine. So how are the teams formed? Like, how do we know, you know which students are gonna be working on this particular project? Is that something that you apply to be part of this group? Every single of the manufacturing students were part of this capstone. So it's not like we chose who our team members were. It's just, you know, that's just the, cor the course of the um, curriculum. And then each of our specific roles on the team were decided by our strengths. So Bradley did the, um, the PLC, and then Ian's was the project manager and um, also did the pneumatics. 
Ethan worked on the sensors. I worked with the technical writing. Kyle also did um, with pneumatics. And so those are all our uh, strong suits. And so we kind of just morphed into taking what our strengths are and then working together as a team to complete the project. Can you talk a little bit more about how you did um, how you designed the uh, the study and and I mean Martin you know, alluded to the the board itself came from RIT but it sounds like you know you had to kind of come up with a lot of the rest of it on your own. Yeah, well, we um, so we used a couple of design tools uh, like the uh, House of Quality and they kind of outline some of the uh, criteria or the um, the, the needs of the customer, which was uh, Dr. Anselm. And once we kind of established that, we actually use some more refined design tools, like a uh, some design matrices. One was a pro and con chart and one, you know, where we would brainstorm ideas and narrow it down to a few contenders and then basically hash out a rough idea of what it uh, was going to look like. And then the you know details that you have no other choice but to decide along the way as things start to develop was more left up to each individual with a specific skill set that dealt with uh, those details. So it, it sounds to me like you know there's a lot of experience on the team in you know robotics, um, but then when you're working with uh, electronics, of course, you're adding the the heat component right? Um, you're adding material science because of the way that, you know, solder moves and, and all that. And so there's other things that you have to contend with. Um, how did you close that gap? So I came in with a little bit of electronics uh, knowledge, not a lot. Um, and I think me and Brad pieced a lot of it together. A lot of it was, you know, Google, we, we, you have to look it up, uh, pulling out manuals, going after people with experience. I, I reached out to my electronics friends and said, hey, uh, this I'm, I'm having problems. Uh, we keep miswiring this, this stuff. How do I how do I do this correctly? Uh, we also reached out to a few professors that weren't related to this course. Um, and then to flip on that and go to the design side, I know Ian has a lot of fabrication um, background. So he was a huge asset in creating parts and making designs and stuff like that. Uh, but a really cool thing that me and Brad did, and uh, I'm really impressed by it, was me and him were able to just sit down and look at this conveyor and say, how did this work before? Um, we didn't have, it was some, it, we didn't have the schematics or the wiring diagram for this old 90s conveyor. Uh, me and him had to sit down point out the contact or relays, point out the switches, find the transformers, all the fuses, see, see how the conveyor was actually working, how, why were there all these relays? What was the PLC doing? Um, we didn't even have access to the PLC, so we couldn't see the code. We couldn't see the inputs and outputs. We were literally figuring this out in our head by chasing wires. Um, and it was really cool. And then we ripped it all out. We said, we don't need this. This is really old technology. And we uh, we did it all ourselves. And we replaced a lot of through hole technology with some SMT boards that we designed ourselves. And it was a really cool process. And I, I don't know, Brad, if you have anything else to say on that. No, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. It's just trial and error, figuring out stuff as it came about. If you didn't know about it, finding ways and people to talk to that do know about it and then explaining that in the best way possible. So like Dr. Reisenen was a huge asset when it came to the electrical side of everything. Dr. Anselm already had a good knowledge base of what he expected to come out of this where just being in industry now, a lot of people don't even know what they want. They just want a thing. They don't know what the thing is. So um, just that, that firm knowledge base that we had access to kind of enabled us to be able to do certain things. My background being in electronics manufacturing, I gave them a lot of limitations. I said, the footprint of this conveyor can't be any bigger than it is. You know, the board is coming in at this rate and we need to have repeatability in terms of electrical con connection to the board where those through holes are. So they had to design their own board stop. They had to design their own vision system. They had to design um, the nomadic systems, they had to design a lot of things from scratch and integrate all of that. And as Ethan said, the old technology, the old PLCs weren't really 
uh, an option because they didn't have access to the code. So they gutted this thing, rebuilt it from scratch. And, uh, and it really fits. The only thing I need to plug in is it takes 110 volts. So I plug it with a standard plug and supply it with air and, and it works. It's really, and they did a lot of quality control analysis too. Like how many boards can you run through it continuously before you have an error and things of that nature. So not only did you have to create, but you also had a, you got a lesson in reverse engineering. It sounds like. Uh, it, it was it was a very interesting experience, and it definitely furthered my electronics um, knowledge based off of how they used to do it. Um, because I don't think I would have been able to just think of a circuit in my head. I had to see it first and what was already there. Like for instance, they had a board in there that probably had 50 components just on the single board for voltage regulation, and we bought. Uh, a one a one component that that had probably like five sub components on it that did, just did a variable uh, resistance for us, and that really allowed us to dial in our sensors without having to you know rebuild uh, this giant circuit board. Um, so it was cool. Let's talk about the results, right? So you know, Martin again kind of touched on this a little bit, but. Um, you know, I'll let the students brag a bit because uh, the the write up that I read that led me to getting in touch with you in the first place um, suggested that you really cut quite a bit of time off the uh, off the old process. We had the requirement um, of being able to test the boards every, I think, 15 seconds. You said something like that. We were able to test the boards within like five seconds each board. Uh, it took a little longer for if there was. Um, if they couldn't detect any um, LEDs, just to um, shimmy the board around in order to to fully see if the um, if it's just out of alignment. Um, so we put a lot of thought into uh, error detecting the program itself. And I, I know Brad can talk more about how he error proofed the um, the programming. Um, but overall, we. Uh, did the design and we had to do uh, whole, all, all of the quality checks in, made it, in order to make sure that the automation process is um, a repeatable process. So um, we tested um, like 100 boards um, going in, 100 good boards and 100 bad boards in order to see um, the repeatability and 100 out of 100 times, uh, like it um, detected perfectly that the, the good and bad boards. The original question was kind of to ask about like the time saving uh, or that the um, our implementation uh, brought about. And it, the main thing is, is that we test the boards not at the end of their manufacturing. There's still battery pack that gets soldered on, selectively soldered. And the, the time savings was more so in disallowing defective parts from going downstream and consuming the time, you know, the time to selectively solder those where they would have, they would not have worked and then have, then would have had to been sorted out even after they had gone downstream. And so they, they, we kind of nipped it in the bud, I guess you could say before the battery packs went on. And also we had a, uh, a bin that the boards would get collected in that they could basically create a buffer and the operator doesn't necessarily have to be present at this machine until it detects a bad board where a light and a siren goes off so that an operator can be giving their attention to something else. Maybe it's the selective soldering itself and only attend to the machine when they have to and when they're alerted. To. So it kind of saves on sending faulty parts downstream and it kind of relieves the man or the personnel so they don't have to babysit it. And what was the range of parts that you had on the board? Oh man, the list is long, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not just parts, but also subsystems and power supply systems and, and optical sensors and it, it kind of pogo pin pneumatic. So, I mean, the list yeah, was Brad's long. counting up in his head. Brad, how many inputs and outputs did we consume in this PLC? We used up the whole PLC. Yeah. Um, so we had our 10 inputs and 14 outputs and we used up all of them. But generally speaking, that's because you have to think about 
not just a one directional approach to things, you know, multiple outputs or multiple inputs need to be uh, coincided with the PLC in order to generate some a value of interest, not just, oh, the motor's on. Okay, the motor's on. What am I actually looking for? And then having sensors and stuff like that to indicate that. It's kind of the fail safe that you put on things. Yeah, I wanted to I answer your question too, Mike. In our industry, very often the designer and the manufacturer are, are separated, right? And these students are manufacturing engineering students, and that's a very broad term. They they studied as undergrads all sorts of different concepts in the area of, of manufacturing. Electronics manufacturing was probably the, uh, the smallest part of all of their, you know, five years of work and co-ops and everything else. But this project. You know, to put in the context of our, our industry, you have the component level, you have the board level or board printed circuit board assembly level, then you have the module level, then you put all those modules together into a product level. And even a lot of that product level has to be then tested, software has to be generated and all of that. And, and these students really did all of those. They did from component level, selecting the right components and modules for voltage regulation, as I forget Ethan was saying a moment ago, to then, all right, saying, okay, I'm gonna build this circuit board with these sets of components. I'm, that's only gonna be one module out of the PLC framework and uh, the physical conveyor turning on and off and then pneumatics. So now they're putting all these modules together to create a product. And then they went through validation and testing to make sure that the product actually met the, the voice of the customer and gave a very nice presentation at the end that went through, you know, how does an operator actually use this thing? You know, I mean, so they went really from zero to 100 on, on every single aspect of this particular device. I have a, I have a good story about sensor selection that we went through. So sensor selection is it hard in of itself you know you have to make sure are these sensors syncing or sourcing what type of plcs do i have and whatnot we kind of learned the hard way that you really have to trust your vendors too we ordered these sensors that we just thought were going to work and turns out the wiring diagram that came with the sensors were backwards so when we plugged it in it popped and we were like well you know this isn't working what can we do we went out of our way uh and we asked the, our, uh, our robotics professor, Dr. Reisman, um, what, what kind of sensors would you, would you use for this? And it, to get our vision system, we took an IR, uh, an IR sensor, right? It, it, read, uh, it read infrared vision, and we actually bought a lower one that was in the, vi uh, the visible light range. It, and using this and putting resistance on it actually created a a sensor that was able to detect light. We were able to narrow that range through voltage to, I think it was 660 nanometers or whatnot, uh, whatever the light, the light spectrum was. But it was just very interesting that, yeah, we could go out and buy this sensor, this product, and at the end of the day, it didn't work. But the things that we made in-house, it, it cost us less than a dollar to make these sensors, and they worked, and they worked well. I was just really surprised by that. And it was a moment of accomplishment for myself. How much were the off the shelf sensors that were wrong? Uh, so, Brad, do you remember? Yeah, they were 24 bucks for two of them and they didn't just not work, they exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so you, made a, you solved the problem with something less than a dollar. So. Right. Yeah. So you, you I got a lesson in, go ahead, Ian. Uh, I was just gonna say, I even, Brought in some sensors from work. They were in the hundreds of dollars range. Some light, uh, the uh, color detecting sensor, and they ended up not being as appropriate as a uh, application as that sensor that we basically made for a dollar. So you got lessons in procurement and polarity at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> right. Dwayne, how yeah. many years have you been working with with groups like this to uh, you know on capstone projects? Uh, I've started this in 2012, uh, mm -hmm. doing the capstones. Now, is this uh, is this typical of the uh, of the nature of the of the projects, or is this um, was this sort of exceptional? Oh no, this is this this is very typical. The first one we did was we built a robotic s'mores machine, 
And from there, we went and we, the next generation, we called it S'mores Point Two. And in there, it, we were able to manufacture a s'mores machine with robots. And the students built it right from scratch. Then we had an automatic bottling line. And in each case, Mike, we had to take a process that wasn't really um, done, all right, in the industry from this size, because you're supposed to make a cellular unit. And within 15 weeks, they designed and built and tested. And so each one of the products that we did, uh, it's kind of exciting. And matter of fact, when we have these types of projects, we leave it up to the students as to what they want to do. And even though uh, uh, Dr. Ensam and I spent some time in looking at the project, it was still up to the students what they wanted to do. And they knew what their weaknesses were. But I'll say this, they overcame any weakness that they had. So you got design experience, you got fabrication experience, you got assembly experience, you got component experience. I mean, there's really quite a bit of things. And yet, how many of you are going to stick with the electronics going forward? <laughs> Just one. <laughs> you know, what the, how, how about Kyle? Uh, we I don't, don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Kyle wants to be a field tech, so it might be. He might do electronics. What I tell my students though, Mike, and, and I know where you're leading the group in that question is that uh, these students as engineers and as manufacturing engineers, circuit boards are in everything today, right? Even if you're not gonna be doing electronics directly, you're gonna have suppliers uh, supplying you with materials that they have some experience in now. So, you know, why teach a mechanical engineering student machining, right? They're not gonna be sitting at a, at an end mill cutting parts, but they need to understand the limitations of the processes that they're designing uh, their products for. So uh, that's really been an asset over the years for our students. You know, I, I couldn't agree more, Martin. And I would add, wouldn't you agree that there's value in, by knowing what different aspects of the, of the um, how to do it yourself, right? allows you to question those who may be working with you or for you down the road to, to press on them as to whether they really, um, number one, understand what it is that they're doing, and, and number two, are thinking about everything they need to be thinking about just to move a product forward, no matter what that product is. I mean, it gives you some confidence that, you know, you don't just have to accept somebody else's point of view as being gospel. Trust but verify. I would uh, I would argue a little bit that you do want to know you do want to be have your engineer walk up to an end mill and start cutting something because you should know quality you should know oh is this acceptable I've been I've worked at a shop before and I've had engineers come up to me and hand me prints they don't use datums they they gave me a picture that can't be created and never in industry do I want to go up and ask something I don't want to ask the impossible of somebody else and on the flip side of that. Sometimes you want to make your own capital, you want to make yeah, make your own money, and you're forced to have small teams. I think if I had the team that I had uh, on that capstone, that I could create machines from scratch. Uh, even though that we might not have been experts, we got it done. And the determination and the, 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 the quest for knowledge, it was there. And we did have somebody that could fabricate. We did have somebody that knew the electronics. And I know going out in the field, and I, I've already done it uh, at my new job, is being able to look at something and just understand it. And that is vital. Yeah, and I want to piggyback on what Ethan was just saying. I've, As I said, I've been working with teams in this particular capstone since 2012. The reality is I've never seen a more cohesive team. And when they ran into uh, situations, I didn't have to step in, all right? These, these students knew exactly what was going on. Uh, Ian did a great job as far as the, the project management part. Bradley did a fantastic job on looking at the, uh, the PLC and Carmela did a great job on the, on the report as well as Ethan was, had his hands on a lot of different things, especially the sensors. And they were able to do it. And Kyle did a lot of the fabrication work. Um, so they worked together and they didn't, it didn't take a lot of micromanaging. If anything, there was no micromanaging, but that's how these students will flourish and you let them see exactly what they can do. And they did a wonderful job. Dwayne and Martin, did you learn anything from this? 
I I'm always that. learning. <laughs> That's part of the reason why I became a professor. It's like every day I'm learning something new. Um, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I went into this pretty skeptical. I think the students may remember some of the things they said in the beginning where, you know, this was not an easy project. This was very challenging. And, uh, you know, what I was, I was surprised and pleasantly surprised at the level of craftsmanship and quality of what um, they presented. And if anything, what I learned was our students after five years of education here at RIT uh, can do almost anything, right? Um, so I was, I was really, really impressed and uh, by this particular group. And that may be to the, to the detriment of the next class that Dwayne teaches next <laughs> year, because, you know, now I may challenge them even more, right? Or, or maybe give them uh, something a little bit more uh, difficult to, to do. I will say one of the thing that we tried to do with this particular project is have it be a springboard for further innovation or further improvements on the existing design. So the next group of students may get where these students left off get as a starting point and add options and other functionality and capability that they didn't have time for. So, um, so I learned a lot in terms of what the students are capable of. My expertise is more in the Lean Six Sigma quality area. When it comes to some of the technology, I'm going to tell you, the students had more knowledge than I did, and I just watched them work. And as I watched them work, uh, especially when it came to the PLC, because I've always had an interest in it, I understand the basis of it, but I learned a lot from watching Bradley. I learned a lot from looking at Ethan and as far as the, the sensors, all right, and the way Ian was actually managing the team and asking questions and guiding everybody, and as well as Carmela doing all the writing that she did, the report that they turned in the end was phenomenal. It actually, I learned, I don't have to have my hands in a lot of this. All I got to do is facilitate. What I'm really impressed about is that I think all but one of you were undergrads at the time. The team nature of this project, of course, is going to be similar to what, what you're going to experience for much of your careers. Had you had any experience working on a group project like this prior to the capstone? I, I haven't. Not of this magnitude, no. Yeah, I'd say that we were part of like every part of the process. I feel like in any industry or any job you would have, you wouldn't be fully involved from like start to finish. The only thing I was going to add to that is here at RIT, a lot of our core classes that are taught through our department have um, projects associated with them, lab projects or what have you, from statics onwards. Um, but this was far more involved. So our students do get a lot of experience working with people that they may not agree with. I don't know if our students can agree, <laughs> nod their heads, right? You're not always gonna work in groups that um, you see eye to eye with, with people. And uh, our, RIT does prepare our students pretty well for those types of scenarios, but I think they did, they did a great job. Yeah, and I like, I'm going to piggyback on that, too. When you look at the entire MFET program, there's industry experience that each one of the professors bring to those come to the to the students, as well as their ability to to allow the students to be open, as well as some growth within that. So I think the whole engineering technology program is really applications driven and allows the students to really get in, dive deep within a project and succeed as a result of the, of the system and the faculty that we have within the program. Ethan had mentioned earlier that part of the, as part of your research, you were picking up the phone or at least reaching out to uh, folks in the industry for help. Um, how daunting was that? And you know, what was the response when you, when you actually reached out? You know, I'm guessing probably most of it was by email, but did you ever have to pick up the phone and call anybody? No, so I'm a very social butterfly. Um, I'm the type of person that can work a crowd. I'm not your typical engineer. You can find me in the club trying to find new resources. Every, every friend that I make is somebody that I can call upon in the future. And that's something that I definitely pushed for engineers is know your assets, know who your friends are, and have the knowledge to know if they know what they're talking about. So picking up the phone, no. Uh, I'm sure all these guys could tell you that I just randomly met these guys in class or I was at a party somewhere and 
that's what you need to do. You need to have your group. You need to have your people. If you want to go far and because you're not going to know everything, uh, but there's somebody that you know that does know. And if not, maybe they can point you in the right direction. So for me, it wasn't that big of a deal. Else? Oh, yeah. I made a really good friend talking to some guy in uh, Mississippi talking about PLCs. He was an engineer of 40 years and he was a wealth of experience. I wish I got to meet the guy face to face because I ended up best of friends with him after an hour conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I still think about it. I'm like, that guy was probably one of the nicest people I've ever met. And did you buy the PLC from him or? That PLC that we ended up having was the version of it, but he told me to go through my company because I could get it cheaper. Overall, the guy was just an amazing wealth of knowledge. He yelled me select things, told me things to look for in PLCs, kind of walked me down that inherent line that everybody kind of messes that part of it up because it's there's so much knowledge that has to go into selecting a PLC. You sit there and think, oh, well, it just has some things that you wire into it and it works and it's perfect. There's connectivity. There's, you know, how are you going to wire the sensors? Are they syncing sourcing as Ethan said? And then all of it put together is just being able to talk to engineers like that and then get that response back. Probably saved me weeks, if not months of research and trial and error and I think that, I don't know, without that knowledge between him and people I work with, I couldn't have bridged that gap so quickly. And that was a cold call? Yeah, that was just, uh, I just looked up a number online and there he was. It was uh, because generally it's through distributors. Mm -hmm. So um, you never actually buy from like the actual manufacturer. So I didn't know about that either. And now I work for one, so now I get it. But... (laughs) Ian, would you agree with all this? Yeah, the um, a lot of the people we approached were um, excited to work with us. Dr. Reisenin was interested in our project. Uh, at the start, we had a few different ideas, and kind of the way we went was the way he uh, really got a kick out of the way we went with it. And he was a wealth of knowledge, and there were people that. Um, there was a particular shop called the construct and they started catching wind of our project and they'd ask us for updates when we'd come by and they let us use their uh, laser cutter and all of their electronics and soldering equipment in there. And there's kind of like a, uh, I don't know, some spectators on the sidelines rooting for us as we were coming to the finish line on this. And um, that kind of um, having that, be known throughout campus i think that helped us they kind of gave us the momentum at the end and to add to that dr risen and getting excited about a project is a feat in and of itself so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Dwayne, is it incumbent on the faculty to find folks from industry to help uh, or is that really uh, you know, the role of folks like uh, Martin and yourself? Well, you know, that's a great question because like Ian did, he went to Kodak and as well as other faculty, we have we have a great relationship with all the faculty and you know where their strengths are. And you also know that's a network of individuals out there. So the students uh, have done a number of times, gone out to industry, made phone calls, drive someplace, go wherever it takes to get this project done. And the whole faculty staff, uh, faculty and staff at RIT in the CET uh, college does the exact same thing. We really look at trying to build a relationship with the industry out there. Um, you know, I did want to say one other thing before I forget. You know, you talk about from a, from a project perspective, they met every single criteria that you would do in the world. So, for instance, you have toll gates, you have budgets, they were under budget. And, you know, when you talk about passion and dedication, this class runs three hours for three hours for two classes at six hours a week. I can't tell you how many hours, but each one of them, I would say, put it on an average of 30 to 40 hours per week on this coming in at night during the weekends. That's pure dedication. And as a result of that, that is enthusiasm that everybody starts looking and say, wow, I really want a piece of that. So it is something that they, the whole 
college um, really just does a great job in bringing everybody into the process. I would also like to like to point out that um, the reason why we were so under budget is because our project probably if it retailed, we had a budget, I think 2000, 2000 or 3000, yeah. it probably was closer to five, but Ian and Brad, they were able to network and communicate with their own companies and say, hey, uh, do you guys have any of this that is just extra that you're throwing out or something like that? And they really pulled through to get us under budget and make make our project just look fantastic. It, it looks industry ready. There's a lot of things to a project like this that can really nickel and dime you. Things that, um, you know, you're on the fence, so you order both of the options and see which one works. And things like material, um, where it's basically scrap metal, it, it, my work, you know, just small pieces of aluminum that you would have otherwise had to shop for or wait to come in and spend money on. And, you know, those are graciously donated. And again, back to the expertise, like I don't know, the, the people that I worked for, I'd come in, kind of ask them about the problem we were having during my class, and they were always ready with something to try. So, like we said, uh, that's kind of like what made us uh, under time we, and under budget was having resources outside of our IT that uh, were willing to help and kind of cheer us on. You, uh, you made gold out of other people's garbage, huh? Yeah. So last question. How many of you were aware that there was a capstone project uh, at the end of your college career? And if so, you know, did it play a role in your decision to go to RIT? I had no idea that there was a project at the end of this. Um, I, I kind of just signed up for the class and stuff like that. But had I known, it definitely would have influenced me to want to go to this college just because it's nice to see everything kind of come together. You know, it's um, uh, you take all these classes, you're like, well, what's this for? Why do I need to understand how to fabricate? You know, I'm an engineer. I don't have to and, and all that stuff. But when it all comes together and you're actually able to put the puzzle pieces together, then I mean, I pretty much called upon every piece of knowledge that I learned, you know, in some fashion. So for me, I didn't know about it, but I definitely would have, I think that if it's not the standard, it should be for sure. I also think that um, a lot of us, so there was only five of us on the capstone project. So starting college, um, freshman year throughout, like we might never have a class with someone uh, with one of them, um, just because our college in itself is so big. Um, most of the people we're with is with the mechanical technology um, students and whatnot, and um, we're the only uh, major in our college that has a college, as in uh, College of Engineering Technology, that has a capstone. So um, coming coming into this major, I didn't know that there was a capstone because all of my friends were um, mechanical engineering or whatnot. So like that's, that's something new. Um, honestly, I came to RIT because they had freshman parking, but <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, but then otherwise I found out about the co-op program. And then um, that's ultimately why I decided to um, go to RIT and choose the manufacturing engineering uh, uh, major. You know, I'm just going to jump in here. The The parking thing is not a small deal. OK, so I'm, I'm 53. <laughs> so I graduated in 1990, but I had a, I went to the University of Illinois. I had, a, I had a car on campus and I guarantee you at that time I spent more on parking tickets than I did on tuition. <laughs> it's not a small deal. Prior to COVID, don't move, don't move your car because there wouldn't be a spot there. And I'm telling you, there was no spots in the whole campus. I believe it. Ian and Ethan, how about you? Um, you know, were you aware of the capstone uh, project uh, when you uh, matriculated RIT? No, I wasn't. My brother actually, uh, actually my 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 brother went to RIT in a very similar uh, program, mechanical engineering technology, where I'm manufacturing engineering technology. And his his final project was in it was a like an addendum to his fluids class, which he did a cool project, but it wasn't as 
encompassing of his ex- total experience at RIT. And um, so, no, I guess I, I wasn't aware until probably a year before when I started talking to gra- people ready to graduate as I was attending that I knew about the capstone and I always wondered what form it would take. And um, I think it was a blessing to be able to uh, finish that way, even though I, I do have two more classes left, but basically finish with the core classes. I, it was a, it, I think it's something that they should do with all of the engineering programs. You know, it was, it was valuable and, you know, it teaches you how to work good with other people and forces you to learn things that, aren't necessarily part of any curriculum. You, you figure out what you don't know and what you, you got to know, and then you just learn it because you got to learn it. And Ethan, I'll let you finish up. Yeah, so I uh, I had no idea about the capstone until probably my last semester. It, these guys have mentioned it before, but uh, we in our college were surrounded by mechanical uh, engineering technology students. Um, and I believe we only graduate like five, five to 10 manufacturing engineers every semester. But it, it was interesting because it, you kind of see your classes get more specialized and specialized towards the end of the year. And like, I think a year ago, I got really close friends with Carmela and Ian. And then uh, I met Brad in our robotics uh, class about the semester before. And it was like, oh, you guys are in our major? That's cool. I've never met somebody in my major. And then to, to know these people and just be friendly with them and then have a class with them at the end of the year, it was just, it was a really good experience. And it really kind of pulled the whole thing together. Um, and like Ian said, I think that all of the programs in our college should have something like this. It should, they should, I don't want to say prove themselves, but prove to themselves that they can do this stuff because this is, this is industry. This, this, what we did can be directly applied in industry. If somebody wanted to buy our test program, they could like, and we could do it again. I 100% know that any one of us could replicate what we did today. did in that project. Yeah. Not just what you did, but how you did it. The, you know, the, the group dynamic, the, the teamwork, the budget, all the rest of it. So congratulations to you all. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. Carmela Stone, Ian Youngs, Ethan Brochar, Brad Brewster, and of course, Kyle Mellendorf, who was not here, but was part of the project, uh, Martin Anselm and Dwayne Beck. Thank you all for joining me on PCB Chat today. Thank you, Michael. Great to be here. We wish you all the best in your careers. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast has been brought to you by Turnkey Pro, from Sierra Circuits. Turnkey Pro is the simplest platform for sourcing all your components, uploading specs for fabrication and assembly, and receiving an instant quote, all online in fewer than 15 minutes. Try Turnkey Pro by Sierra Circuits today and use promo code PCBCHAT to receive $200 off your next order. For PCB Chat, this is Mike Buto. Have a nice day. Beep.